Hey everyone. In this video, we're going to continue talking about functional groups. And specifically, this video is focused on amines. So an amine is a derivative of ammonia. Ammonia is NH3. And if you replace one or more of these hydrogens with a carbon group, that makes it an amine. Now, you can have a single carbon group, two carbon groups, or three carbon groups. If you have one carbon group, we call it primary, two carbon groups, secondary, three carbon groups would be tertiary. And so we abbreviate primary with a one degree sign. We abbreviate secondary with a two degree sign and tertiary with a three degree sign. And once again, this refers to the number of carbon groups attached to the nitrogen. The primary amine has one carbon, secondary amine has two carbons, and a tertiary amine has three carbon groups. Now, how do we name amines? In this class, we're only going to learn the common names for simple amines. And so we name them as alkyl amines, where you name the alkyl groups or the carbon chains followed by the name amine. And so if we have an ethyl group here, this would be ethyl amine. Now, if you have two of the same type of group, like two methyl groups here, then we use those Greek prefixes to identify duplicate substituents. So dimethyl. Or on this one down here, it looks like we have an ethyl group and two methyl groups. So we put those in alphabetical order. So ethyl before methyl. So ethyl dimethyl amine. And when you're doing alphabetical order, uh, the Greek prefix uh, isn't taken into account. So we ignore the di or tri. It's E versus M. Let's do a quick study check. Can we give the name for each amine and can we classify it as primary, secondary, or tertiary? So let's take a look at this one here. I see that there is a three carbon chain. And so three carbon chain is a propyl group. And so this is just propyl amine. Now, this one over here, it looks like we have an ethyl group with two carbons. Looks like there's another ethyl group. And then it looks like on top here, we have a methyl group with a single carbon. And so to put these in alphabetical order, E comes first. So this would be ethyl methyl amine. But because there's two ethyl groups, we would say diethyl methyl amine. Okay. All right. So let's talk about aromatic amines. In chapter 11, we learned the names for some common benzene derivatives. And we learned that an amine attached to a benzene is known as aniline. And so this is your parent molecule, aniline. Now, if you have a substituent attached to the nitrogen directly, to indicate that, in the name, we use a capital N dash to emphasize that a substituent is connected to the N. So here we have a methyl group attached to the N. So when we're naming this, it would be N-methyl aniline. So the N is because the methyl group is attached directly to the N there. Now, if a substituent is attached to the ring, then it needs a number. Now remember, we number the ring starting where the amine is attached. And so if this is position one, that means the methyl is attached to carbon number three. So this would be 3-methyl aniline 
whereas this would be N methyl aniline. So once again, substituents attached to the nitrogen get N dash. Substituents attached to the ring get a number dash. Let's do some practice. Give the name of each compound. So it looks like our parent compound here is aniline. And it looks like our substituent has three carbons. So we would say that that is a propyl group. And this propyl group is attached to the nitrogen. So we would say N propyl aniline. Okay. And this one on the right looks like our parent once again, is also aniline. But we have a substituent here. This is a two carbon chain, so that's an ethyl group. And it's attached to the ring, so we gotta give it a number. So if that was number one on the ring, this would be number two, number three, and number four on the ring. And so this would be four ethyl aniline. Okay. So now that we've talked about how to name these and how to classify them. Oh, I think we forgot to classify these here, actually, before we move on. So are these primary, secondary, or tertiary? How can we tell? Well, it's the number of carbon groups attached. And so this nitrogen here has only one bond to a carbon, so that would be a primary amine. Whereas this one here on the right has three bonds to carbons, so that would be a tertiary amine. So now that we've learned how to classify these and how to name them, let's talk about some physical properties. So amines are typically soluble in water because they can hydrogen bond with water. So nitrogen is very electronegative. And so an NH is capable of hydrogen bonding similar to an OH. But there's a difference between primary, secondary, and tertiary amines. A primary amine has an NH2, which means it has two hydrogens that can participate in hydrogen bonding in addition to the lone pair on the nitrogen. And so a primary amine can participate in three hydrogen bonds simultaneously. A secondary amine only has one NH, and so it can only participate in two hydrogen bonds at a time. And a tertiary amine has no NHs, so the only thing that can participate in a hydrogen bond is the lone pair on the nitrogen. And so it can only participate in one hydrogen bond. So all of these might dissolve in water, but the primary is going to be more soluble in water because it can form more hydrogen bonds. So more hydrogen bonds, more soluble. Less hydrogen bonds, less soluble. So primary are always more soluble than a secondary or a tertiary of the same size. Now let's talk about some chemical reactions of amines. So amines can act as bases. And we learned in chapter 10 that bases absorb H plus. And so in this case, our amine, because it has a lone pair, is going to absorb a hydrogen ion from something. In this case, it's going to be water. And so this lone pair here is going to reach over and steal a hydrogen from water. And that lone pair becomes a new bond here to a third hydrogen. So the NH2 becomes NH3, and it picks up a positive charge. So the nitrogen is now positively charged because it has four bonds. Anytime 
a nitrogen has four bonds and it's positively charged, we call it an ammonium ion. And so the ethyl amine became ethyl ammonium. Okay. So if you're naming ammoniums, you just change the amine name to ammonium. So amine becomes ammonium. Now, if you react an amine with a strong acid, so instead of water, we're going to use something like HCl here. It's an irreversible reaction in which the amine picks up the hydrogen to form the ammonium. And then the negatively charged counter ion is attracted to the ammonium because they have opposite charges. This is known as an ammonium salt. Ammonium salt, positive ion and a negative ion. The positive ion is the ammonium. The negative ion is whatever was attached to the acid. Now, if you want to name these ammonium salts, you name the ammonium ion followed by the negatively charged anion. So in this case, it would be methyl ammonium chloride. Or if you had dimethylamine, it would be dimethyl ammonium chloride. So you turn the amine into ammonium. And if it has a counter ion, you name that last. Let's do some practice. Write the equation for the reaction of triethylamine with hydrobromic acid and name the final product. So first, let's look at the name they gave us, triethylamine. Well, an amine has to have a nitrogen, and it's going to have three ethyl groups. So one ethyl group, two ethyl groups, three ethyl groups, and a lone pair. So that's my triethylamine. And we're reacting it with HBr. And so what's going to happen is the nitrogen is going to steal the hydrogen. The lone pair becomes a bond. And so now the amine is attached to a fourth bond here. And so that's going to give the nitrogen a positive charge. And the bromine that gave away the hydrogen is now negatively charged as bromide. And the bromide is attracted to the ammonium because they have opposite charges. So to name this compound, this would be tri- ethyl ammonium and then we got to list the counter ion so bromide so triethyl ammonium bromide now why do we care about these ammonium salts how are they useful well as it turns out ammonium salts have much, much higher solubility. They have higher melting and boiling points. And so simple amines tend to be liquids at room temperature, whereas ammonium salts are solid powders. And so they're much more convenient to work with and they're more soluble. So things like pharmaceutical drugs, if you want that drug to dissolve in the human body, packaging it as the ammonium salt makes it more bioavailable as a drug. So once again, amines are usually converted to their ammonium salts before being marketed as a drug. And the ammonium salts are solid at room temperature. They are odorless and they're more soluble in water and bodily fluids. So 
advantages of having the ammonium salt over the free amine. Let's take a look at some specific examples. So ephedrine and diphenhydramine are just two examples of ammonium salts, uh, pharmaceutical drugs sold as ammonium salts. So ephedrine HCl here is in Sudafed, and you can see it's got the ammonium functional group there with the positively charged nitrogen, and it's attached to the negatively charged chloride. So this is the ammonium chloride version of ephedrine. Now the diphenhydramine over here is what's in Benadryl. And as you can see, it has the ammonium functional group where the nitrogen is positively charged and it's attached to the negatively charged chloride. So this is the ammonium chloride version of diphenhydramine. So the take home message here is most pharmaceutical compounds are packaged as the ammonium salts because it gives them higher melting points, better solubility, better bioavailability. Now, not all farm or not, not all drugs that are sold as the ammonium salt are pharmaceutical. Um, cocaine is actually another example where it's typically transported as the ammonium salt. It's a hard solid that you can package easily as a powder or rocks or whatever. Um, but this has problems for people who want to smoke it. So because it's the ammonium salt, it has an extremely high melting and boiling point because it's an ionic compound. So people who want to smoke it have to convert it from the ammonium salt back to the free amine. And so they usually cook it with a base like sodium hydroxide or sodium bicarbonate, to remove the extra hydrogen and go back to the neutral amine form. And this neutral form has a much lower boiling point and then it's easy to vaporize. And so crack cocaine is literally just taking the hydrochloride ammonium version of cocaine and treating it with a base to go back to the neutral form, which can then have a lower vaporization point. So that's actually the chemistry behind crack cocaine is crack cocaine is the free amine with a low boiling point, where as regular cocaine is actually the ammonium chloride version. And so it has a boiling point that's too high to be vaporized. Okay, moving on. It's possible for amines to form cyclic rings with carbon. We call these heterocycles. Cycle, because it's in a ring. Hetero means different. And so this is a ring with different types of atoms, carbon and nitrogen. So a heterocycle is just a ring with more than one type of atom in the ring. In this case, nitrogen and carbon. Nitrogen can form five-membered or six-membered heterocycles, and we'll see examples of both of those um, in the next few chapters. You don't need to know the names of these. This is just to expose you to them now for when you see them again in the future. Now, one area we will see these is in something called alkaloids. Alkaloids are physiologically active compounds produced by plants that have heterocyclic amines. So they are amine compounds made by plants 
that have a physiological activity in the body. We use these as, you know, home remedies. We use them as the starting materials for uh, other drugs. We use them in chemical synthesis. Um, they are a huge economic uh, avenue, um, isolating these alkaloids from different plants. A lot of them have complex structures that are difficult for us to make in a lab. And so it's cheaper and easier for us to get it from the plant. And so there's a whole economy about growing certain types of plants just to extract the alkaloids from them. And so we're gonna look at a few examples of alkaloids. You don't need to know any of these specifically. These are just examples. And so nicotine is the first example. Looks like this. It comes from tobacco, and you can see that it has two different heterocycles. It's got a six-membered heterocycle and a five-membered heterocycle. And so it falls into the classification as an alkaloid because it comes from plants, it has an amine, and it's in a heterocycle. Another alkaloid that people are familiar with is caffeine. So caffeine comes from the coffee plant, also in tea leaves. And you can see it's got two heterocycles as well, both containing nitrogens. Six-membered with two nitrogens and a five-membered ring with two nitrogens. So because it's a heterocycle with amines and it comes from plants, it's an alkaloid. Another common alkaloid is uh, morphine and codeine. And so these come from opium poppies, particularly the sap in the opium poppy. And so uh, this structure is kind of large and complex and is difficult to make in a lab synthetically. We can do it, but it's not cost effective. And so pharmaceutical companies actually grow opium poppies, and they extract the morphine from the sap because it's cheaper to get your morphine that way than it is to make it synthetically. And so they have DEA-approved fields where they just grow opium poppies to get your morphine to make your codeine and your hydrocodeine and all your other painkillers. Um, they're made from morphine as the starting material. So it's got this cyclic ring here in the middle with a nitrogen in it. So it's a heterocycle and it's an amine. And because it comes from a plant, it's an alkaloid. And actually going back to cocaine, cocaine is also an alkaloid. It comes from the coca plant. It's got this cyclic, heterocyclic ring with the amine. And because it comes from plants, it's not good. So once again, uh, alkaloids are just heterocyclic amine compounds that come from plants and they have some physiological activity to them. Either they're a drug or a starting material for a drug or uh, something along those lines. Okay. So that's it for the amines chapter. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.